Suddenly she stopped, mid-sentence. She could tell I heard it too. Footsteps on the floor above us. I'm Tom Stewart, and this is my paranormal story. Before I start this episode, I need to ask you a big favor. I just started a YouTube channel, and I'm slowly adding all of my podcast episodes up there, hoping to reach more people. And it would be a big help to me if you would go to my channel and subscribe. I just need 100 subscribers to be able to have my own unique URL. So if you would, please head over to YouTube and search for My Paranormal Story Tom Stewart, and then click the subscribe button. Thank you. As usual, I want to do a quick thank you to everyone who has supported the podcast. Thanks to Denise Bradshaw, Kerry Martin, and Irene Frazier for buying me a cup of coffee. And also to Harold Josar and Jamie Moore for making Venmo donations. It's supporters like you who help me keep this podcast running. And if you'd like to help support the podcast, just go to buymeacoffee.com slash my paranormal or just click the donate button on my website at myparanormalstory.com i've also got t-shirts and mugs for sale on the website too also it's halloween season so if you have a podcast and you'd like me to be a guest shoot me an email and tell me all about it at my paranormal story podcast at gmail.com okay that's it thanks so much for your help and support. Now here's this week's episode. One of the questions I get asked the most when people find out I used to be a paranormal investigator is have you ever had a spirit follow you home? And the short answer is no. As far as I know anyway. I don't know if maybe I've just been lucky or if spirits just aren't attracted to me in that way. Or maybe I have had a spirit attach itself to me and I've just never noticed. In the paranormal field, spirit attachment is when a spirit will attach itself to a person who's been trying to communicate with that spirit or a person who might have been in the vicinity of those communication attempts with that spirit. And for unknown reasons, the spirit might start to manifest at that person's home in many of the same ways that it did at the haunted location. It's one of the many risks of being a paranormal investigator. Now, like I said, I'm pretty sure it's never happened to me, so I can't say firsthand if it is possible or not. But I've known quite a few investigators and mediums who are always cautious about spirit attachment. Most of them will say a prayer or conduct some sort of ritual before and after they investigate, just to protect and cleanse themselves. I don't investigate paranormal locations as much anymore. It's been a few years since I was even on an investigation. I mean, the pandemic last year kind of put a halt to most investigations, but even before that, I had basically retired from being active in the field due to life situations getting in the way. But I've always tried to stay involved in other ways when possible. And over the past few years, I've sort of become more of a paranormal consultant. I mean, I don't know if that's even a thing or not. I maybe invented it. I don't know. But these days, I spend more of my time talking to people who have paranormal situations in their lives. And I've found that a lot of these people don't necessarily want a team of paranormal investigators coming into their home. And frankly, most paranormal investigators are all way too eager to try and get into people's homes. 
I find most people just want someone to listen to their stories and give them some suggestions on what to do and what not to do. So these days, I find myself consulting people with emails and text messages and social media. And this podcast has led to a lot of emails from listeners who not only want to share their story with me, but in some cases, ask me for advice. And I'm thankful that I can still help people in this way. One person who comes to mind is a friend of mine, but let's call her Shannon. Shannon is a nurse at a hospital here in New England. And like most nurses, she has seen her share of tragic situations. For more than 20 years, she has cared for patients who are sick, diseased, injured, suffering. And of course, some of those people have sadly passed away. And I have to give nurses a lot of credit, especially during this pandemic. Nurses go through so much physical and emotional stress every single day. I can't even imagine what it's like. And when you think about everything a nurse sees and feels on a daily basis, it wouldn't surprise you if some of that energy became attached to them. I've always believed that the key to finding out what's really happening in the spirit world is to study hospitals. Hospitals are where most people cross over to the other side. It's the threshold where so many souls take their last breath. And in many cases, a nurse is the last person they see. Now, I've actually consulted with a number of different nurses from different hospitals uh, all over the country. And they've all had similar strange and interesting stories about paranormal activity to tell me. Now, obviously, it would be impossible to properly investigate an actively operating hospital. I mean, with all the people, the patients, the electronics everywhere, it would, it would be nearly impossible to get any kind of data or evidence that could be considered credible. But some of the first-hand encounters my nurse friends have told me leads me to believe that hospitals are probably one of the most paranormally active locations you'll ever find. And as if nurses don't already have enough to worry about, they also have to worry about spirits following them home. In the case of my friend Shannon, that's exactly what happened to her. She works at a pretty large hospital, and one day out of the blue, she sent me a message asking me various questions about spirits, and she decided to start telling me about some of her experiences. Normally, the nights are calm and quiet. The patients are sleeping, and there isn't much of a staff around. The usual machines and computers are beeping, but otherwise, there's not much activity. Shannon is sitting at her desk doing paperwork, when suddenly, she hears footsteps coming from down the hall. Fully expecting someone to be there, she gets up from her chair to look, but the hallway is empty. She looks around for a moment and then goes back to her desk and resumes her work. Then suddenly, the elevator dings. She peers around the corner from her desk. The elevator doors are open, but there's no one there getting in or getting out. Later that night, she makes her rounds, checking in on the patients on her floor. She can't help feeling like someone is watching her. And she feels like she keeps seeing things out of the corner of her eye. Well, maybe it's just her mind playing tricks on her. 
but then as she peeks into one of the patient's rooms, it's dimly lit and the patient is sleeping peacefully. But as she turns to walk away, she notices a shadow in the corner of the room. She looks again, double checking that the patient is still in bed. And suddenly the shadow is gone. Shannon has many stories like this one, strange and eerie experiences. On several occasions, over a two to three week span, she tells me that she was seeing what appeared to be a young man in a military uniform, walking into an empty patient's room. It's always the same room. And when she follows after him to see who he is and who he's looking for, she enters the room to find it to be empty. Another interesting story she told me, she was sitting at her desk one night and she heard what sounded like an animal scampering through the hallway. She quickly got up to see what it was and she swears she saw an orange and white cat running down the corridor and into a patient's room. Naturally, she ran after it, but when she got into the room, there was no cat to be found. Later that week, she found out that the patient who had passed away in that room had a cat that looked just like the one Shannon saw. But the paranormal activity at the hospital doesn't just happen when she's alone at night. She remembers several occasions of being in a patient's room with doctors and other nurses trying to save a crashing patient when suddenly the lights would start flickering on and off for no reason. There have been times on the next day after a patient has passed away that Shannon says some of the nurses will enter rooms and find all of the cabinets and drawers opened for no reason. Sometimes they'll find furniture has been moved or linens hanging off the bed. And the smells. She says that quite often, after someone has passed away, she'll discover a strange odor in the room. It's not an unpleasant smell. She said usually it smells like flowers or perfume. And one time she said she distinctly smelt the odor of a cigar in one of those rooms. When I think about spiritual activity at a hospital, I think about how scared and alone it must be for a soul, especially a lost soul, and to want to attach themselves to the last person they saw. That person was most likely caring for them maybe even trying to save their life. Sometimes nurses are the last people you speak to. They're the last ones to hold your hand as you take your last breath. It just makes sense to me that, as a spirit, you'd want to attach yourself to the most caring person near you, a nurse. As Shannon was telling me about her experiences, I could tell it wasn't easy for her to talk about. I mean, the last thing she wants to do is be fearful of the job that she loves doing. And to now also have that fear be in her own home? Shannon lives with her husband and two school-aged kids in a modest home. But she's not sure if anyone in the family has had the same experiences as her. She's been too afraid to ask them. And she hopes that she's the only one seeing and hearing the things that she's experiencing. She says first it was the phantom footsteps happening now in different parts of her home, usually when no one else was around but her. Then it became strange cold spots and breezes on the staircase and in different parts of the house. 
For a few years now, she's been feeling like she's being watched in her own home. But it was when she started seeing shadows in the corners, that's when she decided to reach out to me. I tried to assure her that the spirits are probably just lost and they mean her no harm. And I explained to her that sometimes things like burning sage or scented oils like dragon's blood can sometimes help calm that activity. But I could tell she needed a little bit more than that. For one, I think she was just looking for someone to tell her that she isn't crazy. And secondly, to make her feel like her family is safe. So I offered to visit her, to see if somehow I could help her, but honestly, I didn't know what I was going to do. I've known Shannon and her husband for quite a few years now, but I've never been to her house. She picked a night when her husband and kids wouldn't be around, as she was still afraid to involve them. Her two-story house was smaller than I expected for four people. She answered the front door and invited me in. The living room seemed smaller than it was with all of the furniture and decorations. There was a fireplace on one wall with a TV above it, and the rest of the room was just couches and chairs and a coffee table and lots of framed pictures everywhere. Family photos, mostly, from what I could tell. But the whole room just felt crowded. I mean, it was neat, and it was organized. You could tell she was proud of the house. From there, we headed into the kitchen, and we sat down at her table. And the kitchen was also neat and clean. I mean, I'm not sure if she cleaned everything because I was coming over, or maybe she's just a neat freak. But that lack of chaos and disorganization made me think that she hasn't been imagining things. I also noticed that she had just about all of the lights on in every room. There were at least three lamps on in the living room. And the kitchen had lights on over the sink, over the pantry, and a large light over the table where we were sitting. That, to me, was definitely a sign that she's afraid of being alone in the house. Now, I'm not a coffee drinker, so she made me a tea, and we sat there and we talked for a while. At first, just small talk, a few laughs about general things. But eventually, we started to delve into the reason I was there. And I just sat there listening attentively to all her stories, knowing that that was probably what she wanted most. Then suddenly, she stopped in mid-sentence, and we could both hear footsteps going across the floor above us. Do you want me to go first? I asked. And without saying a word, she stepped to the side and let me lead. And slowly we walked up the stairs with Shannon close behind me. The sound of the footsteps had stopped, but I tried to go in the direction they came from. As I got to the top of the stairs, I turned to the left and went towards what appeared to be Shannon and her husband's bedroom. It was directly above the kitchen. I flipped the switch on the wall and turned on the bedroom light. The room was empty. Do you want me to check the closet? I asked. And as she nodded yes, I slowly opened the double doors of the closet. And it was filled with clothes hanging shirts and pants and tons of shoes and other items on the floor. But otherwise, it was empty, 
and there was definitely no room for anyone to be hiding. We headed back into the hallway and I quickly checked on the kids' bedrooms. Still no sign of anything walking around. So just as we were about to head back down to the kitchen, the light at the top of the stairs began to flicker. And we both stopped in our tracks. I slowly walked up towards the light and I reached up on my tippy toes and tightened the light bulb just enough to stop it from flickering. Well, I guess I debunked that ghost, I joked. But just then, we heard the strangest sound possible coming from downstairs. I went down the stairs and turned and looked around the banister, expecting to see someone there at the table. But the room was empty. Just the two teacups we had left behind. I stayed and chatted with her until one by one her kids and husband came home. And then the next day, I put her in touch with a spirit medium, a friend of mine, who has since helped Shannon and the spirits in her home find closure and peace. My Paranormal Story is written, produced, and narrated by me, Tom Stewart. Music from this episode, courtesy of Kevin McLeod at Incomptech.com. If you enjoy my stories and would like to support the podcast, you can go to buymeacoffee.com slash myparanormal. Or just click the donate button on my website at myparanormalstory.com. I also have t-shirts and coffee mugs for sale. Because unfortunately, podcasts cost money. And your support helps me keep the podcast running. I also just started a YouTube channel, and I could really use some subscribers. So if you wouldn't mind, head over to youtube.com and search for My Paranormal Story Tom Stewart and click the subscribe button. And I'm slowly going to be adding all of my podcast episodes to that YouTube channel. And hopefully, I can find some more listeners. Please don't forget to subscribe to the podcast as well, so you'll know when I've added new episodes. And feel free to follow me on Facebook and Instagram. Just search for My Paranormal Story. If you have a podcast and you'd like to have me as a guest, or if you'd like to ask me a question or tell me your paranormal story, you can email me at myparanormalstorypodcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. I'm Tom Stewart, and this is My Paranormal Story. <laughs>